Our topic for the panel discussion is reimagining luxury, new definitions and challenges. Our moderator for this panel discussion is going to be travel writer and editor Neha Dara. And our esteemed panelists are Romil Pant, senior VP and head leisure travel, Thomas Cook, India. Joanna Van Grusen, filmmaker, conservationist, and owner of Sarai at Toria. Tristan Bo Delomini, director of operations, Lux Hotels India, Ekor Hotels, and Karin Fansail, general manager, Aman Bagh, Aman Resorts. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there's your panel. Please, can you? give up a huge round of applause and create some energy in this room because I promise you that energy is going to bring the best out of this panel. And, you know, we're looking forward to your conversation on how you reimagine luxury and change the way things run. Well, I hand over to our moderator, Neha. I hand over to you, Neha. Thank you, Tanvi. Can everybody hear me clearly? Okay, hi, everyone. Um, I'm very lucky to have this uh, exciting panel here with me and I'm hoping we're going to have some fun discussion uh, happening soon. Um, in preparation for this panel, I was just giving some thought to the idea of luxury and what it really means. And I realized that at the basic core, luxury is about getting things that we don't normally have. It's about things that are difficult to have, that give us pleasure when we have them. But over time, in the industry that has come to be associated with values of surplus, of excess, of too much. And since we're now having uh, conversations about responsibility, that is something that bothers us and we think about and we want to change. And the moment you start uniting these ideas of luxury and responsibility, I feel the definition of luxury starts changing. Luxury is no longer what we used to think it is. So Joanna, Joanna is the proprietor of Saraya Toria, a lovely luxury boutique property in Panna. And she's one of the pioneers who is redefining luxury in a completely new way. Can you tell us how you see luxury? Well, <clears throat> actually, I had always thought that luxury was um, completely incompatible with sustainability and ecotourism and whatever. And so, when uh, we started, luxury was absolutely not what we saw ourselves as. But I think it has been changing enormously over the last decade. And the fact that I'm sitting here, which was a bit of a surprise when I was invited to, because as I say, we don't see ourselves as luxury, but the fact that I was invited to this panel, I think underlines the fact that there has been a sea change in the way it's seen. Not that five-star um, traditional luxury excess um, doesn't still exist, but I think the discerning traveler is more and more looking for an experience that's not just material. And um, since our philosophy was completely anti the excess and luxury side of things, um, perhaps that's why we're beginning to have appeal in that direction. But certainly now, if you, you know, whoever you read, um, speakers all here today, I think, it, you know, it's very clear, luxury is, is definitely changing its definition. I mean, in a sense, it can be anything. Whoever is speaking, you know, if you're in a hot country, a little rain or snow would be luxury. If you're from England, then, you know, obviously it wouldn't be, sun would be the luxury. So in a way, it's semantic, but apart beyond that, there are definitely real changes happening. And, and I think it's up to us to provide a situation where those who would normally look just for the comforts actually connect more and appreciate that there is something beyond that. As long as you, know, you have some basic comforts and cleanliness, it's reconnecting people who have a urban life to things that are in nature. And actually, I think that's quite an important point. Somebody was, um, I was one of our guests I was talking to was telling me that um, in the earlier years, those with money were often the landowners and the people that lived in the country, but more and more it's the urban people and they are very disconnected from wildlife and nature, and that's what they're looking for. They're looking to experience much more in the 
different cultures and different wild experiences. I, I feel that the emphasis in luxury in this new definition has moved away from items and objects that it was associated with earlier and moved towards experiences. And I'm sure anyone here in Delhi can vouch for it, right? Clean air, for example, is a luxury. Being in a clean beach where you can sink your feet in the sand and have some space to yourself is a luxury. And that's really what this new definition is about. But I think this poses its own challenges. Um, there is a certain kind of traveler who embraces this new definition of luxury, and they're part of the reason that the definition is changing. But there are many others who don't. And selling this idea to them is then the challenge that people like Romil, who's with Thomas Cook, deal with on a regular basis. So tell us a little bit about the good, the bad, the ugly, about this changing idea and how guests take to it. Uh, am I audible at the back? Can you hear him at the back? Okay. okay. Uh, thanks, Leah. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this session. I think it's a very, uh, as the colleague pointed out, the, test, the proof of the pudding lies in its eating. And the fact of the matter is we are debating this or discussing this rather is proof enough that there is uh, a segment which is moving in this direction. Uh, Towards the end, you also pointed out to another fact that uh, increasingly people are also wanting to do luxury which is responsible. Uh, 10 years back, if I rewind myself, luxury meant in your face, bling, uh, a lot of stuff which probably today would be shunned upon. But we are getting people who are wanting to do luxury travel in a much more responsible manner. Uh, we've got hotels which are doing this including one we are right now sitting in, uh, which are, which are uh, uh, moving towards sustainable, uh, responsible luxury. Uh, we've got airlines uh, doing this. There is, you can buy carbon credits today uh, for the CO2 emissions which a plane does. There's, there are a couple of airlines which are listed as carbon neutral airlines, so you could probably use those airlines. Some of the airlines in the Indian space are also offering that service. Uh, a lot of tour operators are moving in that direction. My first experience of that was uh, back in 1991 when I first time visited the Jolly Boy Island in the Andamans. When you go there, uh, people, you have to clean up the place before you leave. You go there. But at the same time, the challenge is that not everyone is as conscious towards the environment, or towards responsibility towards our environment as probably some of the uh, small, smaller or relatively lesser ventures are and lesser number of consumers are as of now adopting that line. Uh, I would also tend to agree completely with her when she says that on ground in the local situations where people face day-to-day -day challenges, they are much, much more aware of it. But probably it is us, the urban people sitting in Delhi's and the Mumbai's and the metro cities who are not as of now as much wanting to do sustainable luxury. There is a class which is moving that direction, but typically when you talk to a lot of customers, uh, what comes to mind is luxury is still defined as that five-star experience with a uh, Mercedes or a Jaguar pickup, doing all the experiences uh, in, in, uh, in a way that luxury does not speak to the entire sustainability concept. Uh, however, the interesting thing is, uh, the, and the positive thing is that uh, as per a, D, a w, uh, UNWTO report, 52% of the people if offered an environmental conscious travel and luxury segment would be more than happy to do it. Uh, the challenge for us today is that 5% uh, of the global carbon emissions are done actually by the travel space. And by 2035, this 5% is actually not even looked at by anybody. By 2035, if this grows at the same pace, it will be about 15%. So that's a humongous number. Uh, so for us, it's a, it's a balancing act between our revenue and our selling of the product. I sometimes wonder though who the onus is on to finally take action. Like if I pose the question in a very brass tacks sort of way, starting with something which is fairly rudimentary, but also very important, what, for example, stops the Thomas Cook from taking a stand saying, we will never use plastic bottles? I say this because all of us have seen, you know, tour buses or tour cars with cartons of uh, 
water bottles at the back and maybe somebody's taken a couple of sips and then it's discarded and they're just collecting. So what if you just took a stand and said, okay, we won't do this, what stops you? So uh, there are two kinds of aspects which I'll probably talk about here. One is uh, the mindset aspect of customers. Now, if today any of us who goes to Europe, the hotel clearly states at the check-in check stage itself and even in the properties that drinking water from the tap in the bathrooms is safe enough. Whereas as, as a set of people, as a country, we have a challenge in terms of our belief is that the drinking water in the washrooms is not safe enough or we've been brought up in a manner which states that if you do drink water from the tap in the washroom, there's something wrong that you're doing. We have to service the customer as well and therefore the requirement of clean water uh, is important. Is it as important? Uh, is, it, is there a challenge with RO water, for example? No, and there are people who are trying to work in that direction. However, the usual customer, which is urban, middle, upper middle class or high net worth, still prefers uh, to have, our first reaction is, where is my mineral water? Can I just give and, and a little example? When we were thinking of starting the Sarayatoria in 2009-10, my bottom line was there's no way we're having plastic bottles. And everybody said, you can't run a hotel with, no, with plastic bottles, without plastic um, drinking water. So I said, well, it's hotel or no, or no hotel, but plastic bottles are not going to be on show here. So we started, we put an RO filter where people could see it and um, had no plastic or bottled water available. Not one person even asked us. Well, actually, that's not true. Two people in the first year did ask us. They were both NRIs from America. But otherwise, nobody else. They totally accepted it. And now it's becoming much more a norm. Absolutely. And I think it can be done in um, Absolutely. So, your uh, buses and cars also. You can put RO water in reusable bottles and you don't need to use plastic. People are becoming much more aware and certainly after David Attenborough's blue ocean, everybody knows how much plastic is in the ocean and where our bottles end up. You know, one million bottles a minute are sold every minute in the world. You know, this is not sustainable. I want to jump in here as well because I totally agree, even though we do, we're not 100% plastic free yet, we're on our way, um, but it is also educating our guests that we tell our guests on arrival that is RO water in the room, you can brush your teeth, you can drink the water, the water that we serve in the restaurant comes from through our RO system so that it's an education not only for ourselves but also for the tourists that come into the country. Absolutely, so uh, my only submission here uh, would be, uh, when you are in a scale business, uh, you get all kinds of customers. There are customers and amongst us also out here, our standard uh, operating procedure, if we go out say for a drive from Delhi, even to Jaipur would be, why don't we buy a couple of water, uh, bottles of water and keep it in the car for safety's sake because we don't trust the water en route. Now, while I would as much as possible want to get away from this uh, concept, I also need to have serviced my customers to the extent that they want to. Like you said, the movement has started. Uh, you may not be completely free of plastic, but yes, there is a direction that we all are working towards. Uh, small examples have started coming up everywhere. The local communities are helping uh, or rather pitching in to educate the customers or the tourists as is as uh, people like us are. So just to give you an example, uh, we, ensure, uh, we ensure that when our uh, tourists are traveling between say a Leh and a Pangong Lake or a Leh and a Nubra Valley, whatever waste that is created en route for a lunch or a dinner or wherever that is collected and got back and disposed of. Similarly to the islands in Andamans, similarly wherever we go, uh, we try and do that as much as possible. But yes, there is a there is a change in mindset for all of us because I would tend to think 80 to 90 percent of our people who are here would do the same thing uh, when not given a choice. So for example, when we drive down from here to Jaipur, we would pick up a couple of uh, plastic bottles just by force of habit 
and that habits uh, that change in habit has to be repeatedly reinforced that look you should carry a bottle, couple of bottles of water from home which are probably ro clean because that probably is cleaner than what you buy outside uh, given that we all know what is the state of contamination of so called bistery mineral plastic bottled water in india i think with this room i'm probably lucky i have a room full of people who carry bottles from their own house when they go on that trip to jaipur okay uh, what we have been talking about so far is the ecological aspect of uh, responsibility but there's also a cultural side to it a cultural side which is all about going local about giving space to communities and highlighting them in every way possible uh, that i imagine poses a big challenge for big hotel chains like accor where uh, the core of your philosophy is also about standardization it's about offering the same kind of comfort and elegance no matter where i am whether it's delhi or london or new york or any other city in the world so when you are stuck with these two almost seemingly conflicting ideas one of standardization and the other of showcasing the local and the community how do you sort of deal with this uh, situation am i audible yeah okay i don't like the terms of standardization actually today uh, I, i cannot say and i don't consider we are we have, we have a standardized chain of hotel we have a lot of hotels that are a part of the luxury division and none of it are standardized as such <coughs> today the the most important thing is the guest experience and where we need to find a common dna is more in the soft skill rather than in the the hardware so today our hotel our objective our hotel have to blend with the local community um, they have to be they have to offer a guest experience that blends with that local community be it with the design of the hotel be it with the food and beverage experience be it with what we can offer as the activity to the customer so these are more into guest experience now what we what we are doing in accor in terms of uh, standardization looking for a common dna in terms of sustainable development it's a fact our industry has an impact on the planet you know when you when you wash 140 million towels when you serve 50 million breakfast a year you have a toll on the planet and this is the case for accor but it's a case for all the chains of hotel any every any hotel by the way so the matter here is to be to be proactive you know and 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 not and not reactive uh is to prepare ourselves and we have been doing this since the past 20 years it's actually sustainable development is a new concept it's it's about 20 years ago so we first started with with drawing uh, an environmental chart as a commitment to the local community to the employee to the customer and 8 years ago more or less we uh, we have established our cop 21 within a core uh, we call it planet 21 and uh, planet 21 is a very strong and established plan for sustainable development that gives objective very strict objective to each of the hotel in the network and it's a plan on 5 years so the first cop 21 for aco planet 21 is now end it uh, it, it was over a period of 5 years from from 2011 to 2015 so it's over we have measure all this we have data we have successfully managed to reduce the carbon footprint of accor within the world we have reduced water consumption we have reduced our energy consumption we have reduced our waste however it's not sufficient it's not sufficient at all we we need to go further now and that's what we have started we have realized that we need to invest more in new techniques 
we need to invest more in uh, research and development. We need to invest more in um, smart buildings. So to go, to go further uh, and to develop the second plan, Planet 21 number two, that goes from 2016 up to 2020, a core uh, management has decided to, to, um, to, to decided to order three major studies. One is to study the footprint of a core as a global network on the social and economical environment. The second one is to study the footprint of a core on the environment. And the third study is to understand what are the habits and what are the expectations of the customer towards sustainable development. I, I find that the third might perhaps be the most useful because I think it is very heartening to know that Accor is making such serious efforts and of course that places like ITCR as well. But I feel that what's also holding us back in many ways are what we say we think the customer needs, whether it's Romil talking about the use of plastic water bottles and saying that you know there is a certain client who wants it, or when you're talking about the kind of experiences you offer. And I wonder if these are assumptions we make, or it is really like that, and if mindsets have to be changed, how that can be done. So I think an effort to actually understand whether people really want these things, or we're just assuming they do would be interesting. That's precisely the, the result of that study uh, on, on the customer. It was done on a panel of 7,000 customers all over the world, from developed country and undeveloped country. And this has given tangible results in terms of what the, the customer is expecting. And one of the uh, findings is that for sure, 65% of the customer who have been uh, uh, part of this, of this study, 65 of them are uh, very strongly believe in sustainable development. They want our hotels to, to embark in, in this, in this uh, plan. They want, uh, they want concrete measure from the hotels. Uh, they want uh, the hotels to be part of the local community. They want to experience local community experience. So it, it's very, very important. And it, it gives very good, very good results because now we know and we, we are able, and that's the objective of the Planet 21 number two, is also to embark our customer in this journey and I think to make them part of the, of the trip. I think 65% is a pretty positive number. It is a very And I think it's number. a number that should give us the strength to bulldoze the, ready, uh, the remaining 35% into doing the same thing. Would you like to add something? Add uh, to what he's just said. I think it is not a individual approach that will work. It is a 360 approach. Because uh, we will embark on the mindset change and we've already embarked on the mindset change. However, what it requires is an effort from the hotel industry, an effort from the transport industry, and an effort from the activity industry, because ultimately, as players, we can keep talking about it, but to service that volume of customers, and we work big with Accor. We do a lot of stuff with Accor at a global scale. Uh, we need to have uh, availability of similar levels in order to service the scale at that we operate in. I'll give you another small example. Why is it that a country like Bhutan, and, and I was hearing uh, the discussion earlier on Fobjiga, is much, much better environmentally and on the sustainability side from as compared to probably some of our tourism destinations because they've, they've taken conscious steps. The properties there are not more than two stories high. You do not have lifts in most of the properties and you are supposed to carry your own luggage the customers don't mind that once they reach there because we educate them prior to going uh, that look, this, these are the challenges but you have to be ready to accept it. So people don't mind doing that but it has to be the availability for the mass scale customer. The, the level of customers who are traveling now is increasing by 40 million, 50 million a year and, and therefore the, it has to be a 360 at an industry level. 
So actually what that makes, it makes me feel very good about this panel today because it's giving me the opportunity to then urge you, Romil, and you, Tristan, to go back, have a conversation about this as two of the people who are stakeholders in this, take a call on how to convert the remaining 35%, and then when you take some interesting decisions, Outlook will be here to amplify them, like Indranil always says. But I'm gonna to come to Karen, and I realize that we've been carried away and we have very little time. But you offer a similar luxury experience with a lot of elegance and comfort, but you do it in a very uniquely rural setting. That's what Aman Bag and the Aman Resorts do. Does that have its own set of challenges? How do you pull that off? I think maybe the challenges is actually working in our favor for us being so remote and so rural. Um, because a lot of, to be responsible, it's all about the people. And if we have happy people, have happy staff, happy communities, we have happy guests, and we have happy investors. So for us, we were fortunate enough to work with our um, local community <coughs> since prior to opening so in the building process. So they saw the benefits through job creation, through sk skill development in the village. And it built through that today they bring forth that happiness and that um, the benefits that they reap in the village to our guests and then ultimately to our investors. But what do we offer on a luxury scale and an authentic scale is very aman and very different. We have very limited location, very limited um, inventory. We are two hours from Jaipur in the middle of nowhere. Somebody said that to me last night. Literally, we are in the middle of nowhere. So our um, culture is a very big focus for us. And not two guests will have the same cultural experience at the property because it's a living culture. And whether you go to the village now or in three hours from now, it will be two different experiences. And that's what guests want. Guests no longer want the goods, as you said so, so rightly earlier on. They want the experience. And part of the experience is not only the clean air that you have here in Delhi, but it's also what we can offer. We have the silence. We have the beauty around us, time. Those are commodities that price us today. And there's not many people that have that, that come from fast-paced lives. People want to connect with each other. They want to connect with their family, not just through Facebook and social media, but by sitting and talking to each other. We have no TVs, so that's a different form of luxury. There's no televisions or music centers in our rooms. We get our guests to connect with the village people, with our staff. We grow our own vegetables, and the guests get involved in that. We grow 80% of our own vegetables, and the other 20% or about 18% is grown by the local farmers, and we only get about 2% from town. Um, our staff, 186 staff for our 37 rooms, 82% um, of them are from our local community. They learn to speak English with us, they learn their skills with us, and they work with us in giving back to the community through our education programs because we are already investing in the next generation of hoteliers and of service-oriented staff in our own community. Um, many of them want to go to the cities, like most young people want to, but first of all, they come through us and they do their internship with us and then they're ready to go similar to what they do at Jetwing, I think it was, in Sri Lanka, where they do a program with us, and then after that, they're free to join Akor <laughs> or you. <laughs> but I, I'm sure you have all local staff as well where you are. Okay, so the way you put it, being rural actually sounds like an advantage, oh, where it's, it's so much easier to have. But for you, Joanna, is it the same way? Because uh, Karen also has the advantage of being part of a chain and that brings certain sort of comforts and ease with it, I imagine. You do this as a standalone property and at an operational level, is that a challenge to deal with? Well, I, I don't really consider we offer luxury. I mean, that's not how I look at it. But I think, I mean, what Karen said really struck a chord because so many of our guests say it's the first peaceful night's sleep they've had on their whole tour. You know, there's no dogs barking, there's no marriage party happening, there's no truck horns going. So I think that is a luxury, that, you know, peace. Um, 
And I mean, all tourism is a luxury, and we are maybe in a slightly higher bracket, nowhere near a sort of Amman or a core, I don't know, but um, so some people would put us in a luxury from that point of view. But we, our cottage, we only have eight rooms, and they're mud cottages. No, obviously no televisions and what have you, but um, I think what people appreciate is the space, the peace, we're in a very, very beautiful location and the various experiences that they have, both connecting with the local people and also um, with the surroundings. And all our staff come from the local villages and they, apart from the quiet nights, they're the next most commented upon aspect. The, the service is so lovely. And it's just the natural hospitality. I mean, we've trained them, but not on six months training. I think they had to learn within two weeks because They'd helped build the property and then they started to be waiters, so we had to you know, say this is a knife and this is a fork and this is where you put it. Um, but they're just brilliant and they're, they're certainly appreciated. And certainly the kind of um, guests we get would be in that luxury category. You know, they may go on to stay in an Amman hotel or whatever, but they appreciate it, what we offer as well. I think it's evidence of this changing definition of luxury that while you don't think you're offering luxury, to the rest of us here, the Sarai Toria experience is about that. And it makes me very happy that we now have places which have mud cottages and floors that we call luxury. I would like, have liked us to brainstorm more about how we can change mindsets of how we can ignore that 35% and push through an agenda for the 65%, but I have this big red sign telling me time's up. So I'm gonna wrap this up, but thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.